my journey started back when I was pretty much born in the theatre. My mum and dad had moved to uh, Lyon, Lyon Opera Ballet. They were both dancers. Uh, my dad rapidly became an assistant director uh, to the choreographer who was at the time the director of Lyon Opera Ballet. My mum was a dancer. They decided to have kids fairly early and uh, my brother and I were born just like that. My brother is the eldest of us both. At that time they didn't have money to uh, have a nanny or anything like that so we were brought into the theatre most of the times um, and cared for several dancers or sometimes the stage door people you would actually take care of us which is I still have fond memories actually of the stage door people who adored us of course because we, we were the only kids uh, around there. We relied enormously on the theatre community because it is a family after all uh, from you know, stage managers to a stage crew to anyone that works in the theatre. We all know each other and of course we, we as kids, we knew everyone in the theatre. And the, the thing that was really interesting is that although we were, I mean, we were definitely, you know, obviously born in France, um, we moved about after that because my mum and dad followed the director at the time and choreographer uh, who was called Vittorio Viaggi and he then went to Reggio Emilia in Italy. So from Leona Prabale he moved to Italy and of course we moved also. And so we learned, we spoke French, we spoke Italian, we spoke Spanish. And the interesting bit is that every time we had, you know, uh, the babysitter dancer at the time, whatever, in, you know, in the dressing rooms, we would speak to them in their language, in their, you know, native language. And at no point I remember thinking, oh my God, I, I remember just being all a big language. So it's an interesting fact when people talk about kids uh, learning languages that, you know, they, that grown-ups will think that kids will get confused and actually you don't get confused. Uh, it's, it's all one part of one big language, isn't it? I do remember when we moved around, because we were two at the time, uh, my brother and I were very, very close. We are only a, a year and a half apart, so, and I've always been the same height as him, always. <laughs> so we, everybody thought we were twins. And, uh, and so we, I always felt protected because wherever my brother went, I, I tagged along. And I, it's still the same as grown-ups. <laughs> so, um, but it's, uh, yeah, so wherever we moved, we, we felt, I don't know, we had no choice. We had no choice. So it didn't feel, you know, I was way more anxious than my brother. My brother was very easy very um, open to new stuff, very, you know, so easy, immediately made friends. I was more hesitant, but, you know, I had the safety of my brother. When we finally moved back to Spain for a little while, of course, you have to think that I grew up in the theatre, so we didn't have nannies per se. I remember one babysitter at some point, but hardly anything. And, uh, and so we would go to the theatre very often and um, stay in the dressing room. Sometimes we were put in the little boxes and we immediately knew how to behave because, well, a, my mum and dad would say, you mustn't say anything, but then they will just go and do their dance and we would be left on their box, you know, on, on a box on our own. So I guess they really trusted us. Apart from one time, I remember, <laughs> my mom still talks about it, where we find, found our way back, backstage, and we went to the wings, and we were literally holding hands, age maybe four and five, or not even, three and four. And my mom had to do this duet, and <laughs> she saw us in the wings at the beginning of her duet, and I think she had another child during that duet. <laughs> She was so nervous because we were just on the edge of the wing and she felt, she thought we were going to walk in and that was, that was going to be the end of her career. <laughs> she would be sacked forever. Anyways, um, so we, we basically, it's a way of saying that we were bottle fed. As we moved along and we moved back to Spain, my parents uh, took over a company and uh, a school in the Canary Islands. By then we were four kids, so they had, you know, four, four siblings. So they thought it would be good to settle 
somewhere safe. And so they went to the Canaries, they built the school from scratch, they built the company from scratch, and it was extremely successful. So once again, we were constantly, you know, surrounded by artists, by, um, you know, rehearsals, by shows, by... So as I think any child that grows up in that environment, you have tendency to kick against it a little bit. And so I didn't want to be a dancer, neither did my brother. Uh, and my two sisters were too little anyway. So it was a point where my mom just wanted to be a little bit more... In, in, she felt like we were, te you know, getting to 12 years old, 13 years old. And uh, she wanted to have us at um, eyesight, if you know what I mean, uh, because she thought, I'm not sure what they're going to do, they're friends, you know, if they go out and God knows what will happen. So you come to class and, and I kept saying, well, you know, can I not do something else? And then she said, yes, you find what you want to do and then you can do it. But if you have nothing to do, then you come to class because I want, you know, I don't want you out in the streets on your own at 13. And uh, so I kept finding things to do, like piano lessons, and you know, I did ceramics, I did painting, I did anything to get out of that ballet class, which I hated. <laughs> so th there it was. My brother continued dancing a little bit here and there. He liked football, he liked sports and, and, and all that. And, but he was very gifted, very, extremely gifted for dancing. And, um, and they decided that maybe if he wanted to dance, he, he should try to go to Cuba because they felt that the teaching there was very um, strong for the boys. The ballet world is, is a niche, isn't it? And, and uh, they felt always that because they were both, uh, my mum and dad were contemporary dancers, but they were classically trained and they trained with, you know, everyone, Rosella Hightower and so on. They went everywhere to follow the teachers that will, you know, motivate them and, and, and make them better. Um, so they knew the classical world uh, as much as the contemporary world. So when they were training us, they, they really, they felt also Cuba and Spain has a big strong link, not only the language, but also historical. So I think they felt that every time the Cubans came, their technique was so polished and so strong and, and they felt that the teaching was really good. So they sent my brother to Cuba for a summer school uh, for two weeks and I chaperoned him. I basically just went to take care of him in a way. And I ended up doing class and, and, and it's interesting because it just takes one person to have, uh, to find something good in, in you. And I think I had that. Um, I had, uh, so, so we went that summer and then we, we went back the, the following summer and the following summer I thought, you know, I, I don't want to be in the in a class with, you know, the losers kind of thing, or, you know, the ones that never, they do it as a hobby. And I, I want to be with the good ones. I want to be with my brother also, you know, in the same class and so on. And so I worked hard to get to a level in class that was acceptable. And when I get there, I got there again into the, you know, Cuba atmosphere, which is just gorgeous and everybody's so happy and just beautiful, such a beautiful country. Um, I went to a higher level, uh, luckily. And then um, it took one person to look at me and said, oh, I think, I think you've got talent. Actually, I really like what you've got. And so he choreographed something for me for the show at the end of the, of the summer course, out of the blue. And that boosted my confidence so much uh, that I felt that maybe, yeah, maybe I had something, maybe I should give it a go. So I came back and and said, Mommy, I really, really want to dance. So she nearly had a heart attack, understandably. She's like, you are 14. You left it too late. I mean, what were you thinking? And, and she said, well, yeah, fine. OK, well, listen, if you want to do it, that's fine. But you're going to have to work super hard. And when I'm saying super hard, I'm saying every spare hour. And I was like, yeah, well, OK, I'll give it a try. I'll give it a try. What can I lose? And by then, I had already started singing because uh, I loved singing. I still love it, but I don't sing. I loved opera some, for some reason. I loved it. And so I went to this teacher who was an opera singer 
herself and she had become a teacher and so we started singing opera and I loved it, absolutely loved it. Um, to a point where she must have seen that I had some kind of instrument, you know, that, that was valuable and she said, you know, I can't teach her any longer but if I was you I will I will take her to mainland Spain to this other teacher, she's very good and, you know, she might have a career. And my mom said, well, what do you think? And by then it was like 50-50, it was like dancing or opera. I was doing one day a week, singing one day a week and I was dancing every day of the week for six hours. So clearly I felt more confident dancing. And it was more in my, I think, you know, it was in my nature. I felt like I could, I was very, very shy. I could really be myself on stage. Um, so I I stopped singing and I and I started fully, fully dancing. It's really hard having your parents as, as teachers, but I remember my mom saying, you know, when I'm in the studio, I'm your teacher. When I'm at home, I'm your mother. So make the difference. And my brother ignored that <laughs> completely. And he was always getting <laughs> a massive, you know, they were always rowing here and there, you know. Um, and they will, they, they will sack him from the, you know, they will just go, oh, my mum will constantly be going out of the class, you know, out, go to your father's class. <laughs> and so my brother will go to my father's class. And then my, after a week, my father will go out of the class, go to your mother's class. <laughs> and so he'll continue with my mother's class. And he was yo-yoing between, which probably was the best thing that could happen to him because he got both, both teachers, which, which are fantastic. And, um, while I kind of stayed more with my mum, because she was nurturing me more, a little bit. And, and then from time to time, I will go to my dad's. My dad is a great technician teacher also, but especially for men. So, um, so yeah, so I, I, we would go from my mum and dad, but especially my mum for me was the, the, the person that really helped me throughout in, in a much more uh, present way. Um, and also because of points you work and all that kind of thing that only women could really... And uh, so, yes, it was difficult, but there was points where I would probably was just going oh, and ro my eyes were rolling backwards in a really horrible way, as a daughter can do only to your mother. But, but nevertheless, I tried to keep, you know, that relationship as organic as possible. I've always been very upset minded in the way of, you know, the, the right journey for a dancer. I've never really had an idea of what that contained because I was very... A, my parents were from a contemporary dance background. We moved about all the time. Um, and my parents were very family orientated. So we, we were very close, um, a very close family. And we still are a very close and very tight family. Um, so it was all about love and, you know, and, and less about, you know, uh, uh, your journey as a dancer. Uh, I think at one... My parents were very hesitant, I think, that we would follow their footsteps. And so I think that's why they kept it quite flexible in a way. So we could say no at any point and there would be no, no problem. So in a way, I mean, when I say they kept it flexible, I mean emotionally flexible. Not we, when we were in class, we were full on and there was two and a half hours nonstop and your work has to be a hundred percent. Otherwise they will really get cross and they will get cross with us I, openly. Um, but, but, uh, but when it came to, do you want to give up? That wasn't an issue. If we wanted to give up, we could say it. It wasn't that they would be let down or, you know, they would feel let down after all this work. There was none of that. And so I never felt like I would, um, yeah, I, I don't know. I always felt very protected, very organic. It was all, always very organic. The thing with uh, I, I, with work, and you know exactly what I'm talking about, is this a catch-22, because the more you do it, the better you get, the better you get, the more you want to do it. And so it kind of goes around. And so it hooks you. And, and I think it's, not, it's, it's in everything you do, sports, and, you know, and, and it, it does hook you. And then it becomes... The notion of giving up is non-existent. You just continue till somebody tells you that that's not your journey. But so when, so it came from my parents, actually it came from my mum who said, 
I think they should do competitions. And and my brother and I were always a team. So we were always like twins. So there was never a decision for one that would be different for the other. So it's like if, if one person does a competition, but they both do it. And so we, we started. We started competing mainly because my mum wanted to know the level that we were at. Also, she wanted to give us the exposure because we were in the Canary Islands. I mean, it couldn't be more yeah, lost in the world. And, uh, and so we started and we did a, a mini competition in Bordeaux or somewhere like that. I can't really remember. We didn't get that far. Um, and then she thought Lausanne would be the, the perfect one. And so we went into Lausanne. My brother won uh, first prize and I won. Uh, no, and I was finalist. But we got to, a, you know, Lausanne is a big thing and all the all the schools in the world. And I remember the gala. Well, I remember Pat Neary was in the in the jury. Um, and then the gala was Darcy and Carlos and everyone who was everyone was in that gala, Patrick Armand. So we, our eyes were literally popping out of our sockets going, oh my God, this is what I want to do. And, you know, you felt like, um, yeah, you felt nice that, that your work had come to, to fruit, fruit, yeah, that, that had flourished uh, to that point. So then my mother decided to take us to Varna. I had never heard of that, never in my life, neither did my brother, I think. So she said, we, we are going to another competition. This is in Bulgaria, it's Varna competition. But because they always said it so lightly, we thought it was just like, I don't know, it could, you could have said Ealing competition, you know what I mean? <laughs> the same. So we're like, okay, okay, Varna competition, where is that? In Bulgaria. Okay, well, all right. So no homework whatsoever. And we just arrived there. We saw everybody, Paris Opera, the lot, everybody who was, everybody was there. Um, and, uh, and so we started competing and we started getting through and through and through till we get to the finals. Now Varna was a very interesting one because I only realized how important it was afterwards, never during or before. Otherwise I think I would have got nervous, but I wasn't. And the hardship of Varna is that you, you perform. You, you might perform at 2 a.m. and you might rehearse at 4 a.m. You know, it, it just works that way. And it was a very hot summer, I remember. So, and it's open air, it's wooden floors. Uh, the theater had holes everywhere. So you had to really be careful to skip the holes when you are doing, you know, variation. My brother and I were teaming up as a couple. Uh, so we were dancing together all the time, uh, which was great fun. Um, and so, yes, we, it was basically the battle of the fittest because when you have to perform at 4 a.m. or, you know, rehearse at 3 a.m., um, your body clock is all changed. But because my brother and I were so chilled and we didn't realize, we were just making friends. That's all we were doing. And, uh, and my parents were... <laughs> were petrified. They were just going, can you take this seriously? This is a really important competition. <laughs> and we're like, yeah, we are taking it seriously. <laughs> Anyways, we ended up winning some medals. And so, um, and then Patrick Dupont at the time, the director of Paris Opera saw us and they really liked us. Uh, Makarova was in the jury also, Patrick was in the jury. And uh, most of Paris Opera was, was competing also, which of course they did well also. So Patrick Dupont invited, invited us both to audition for Paris Opera. When I grew up, I had these pictures always of, you know, as you do in your folders and your cupboards. And I always had Sylvie Guillem because I thought like she was tall and beautiful and I thought I want to be like her. And, uh, and of course I will gear up towards tall. I had Makarova, of course. Because, you know, I would watch her swan leg and I would be like, she's my idol and, and so on. So I had a few ones. I have Elisabeth de Tarabus, I remember also, and a few, a few ones that I, I really enjoyed their dancing because it felt to me like they were speaking when they were dancing. Um, and then the physicality of Sylvie was just so glorious. Um, Darcy also. Again, I would, you know, I was tall. I was tall since I was, I've been this tall since I was 15. So I, can, I could only grow taller. So I was never going to be a small dancer. And, and I think my parents, 
yeah, they kind of, they kind of, they never verbalized it, but I think they knew that I would have to fit in in a tall, you know, acceptable tall company. And Paris Opera was one of them. And so when the chance of auditioning came, I was going, yeah, this is definitely my company. I love Paris Opera. I love everything about it. I'm going to just go and love this, this moment. So I did. And, um, and I joined the company. They offered me um, a job for September and I thought, yeah, okay, I'll take it. It's good fun. Skip, you know, uh, school. Thank God for that. <laughs> I didn't finish my last, you know, I started my last year and then I didn't finish it because I was like, oh, Paris Opera. My dad said, go, because this is your chance. Otherwise, you know, you can study at any point in your life. You cannot dance at any point in your life. Just go. I was like, oh my God, my dad, the academic, <laughs> is telling me that. Okay, <laughs> so, um, so off I went. Then I started my career at 17. It was a shock, but going into Paris Opera, I, you know, I was there thinking, I'm worth it. You know, I've, I've just done Varna. Well, I've done, you know, a few competitions. I feel like I'm, I'm good. I'm, you know, I've got a chance to this career. So I went in thinking, how fun, and I'm going to learn so much. And it was like a door just went slap. <laughs> and of course, exactly, I came from a very loving, you know, a village kind of thing, atmosphere, uh, a school that was just so, so nice. The atmosphere was always lovely and, you know, you were there to work and, and that's it. And it was very... Yeah, very political, very, you had to follow certain rules. I didn't understand what kind of rules, why did you have to follow these rules? But of course, everybody was very, um, how do you say it? You know, everybody, all, everybody had come from Paris Opera School, most of them, the majority. A few had come from the Conservatoire, but most of them from Paris Opera School. So they all knew each other. They, had, they were so regimented. They were so, um, you know, made as people. And I had just left my mum and dad, my siblings, all behind. Um, and I, you know, all I wanted was love, it was to be loved again. And everybody was so harsh and so independent. And so, and I thought, okay, well, great. Okay, I'll have to be like that. But I remember at one point where I was in the corridor and I would say hi to everyone. <laughs> like, good morning, good morning, good morning. And I overheard someone say, Oh, she's annoying. <laughs> and I thought, oh my God, I've never felt so bad in my life. So I had to then, you know, stop saying good morning. And because I felt like I was annoying certain people. It was just, you know, it was such a different atmosphere. Very different. Very, I felt edgy, a little bit edgy atmosphere. Um, but then once I got to know them, of course, you start making friends and then you have your groups. Um, so you learn. To me, it was a crash course on how a company works because I had no idea how a company worked. I, you know, apart from my parents' company, but it was contemporary, it was choreographically led. So I had no idea what it, it intended to be in a company, no idea. I had never worked with one um, and it was very much, yeah, it was a crash course. So you do class and now you go to this rehearsal, now you go to that rehearsal and I was covered. I seemed to be covering everyone in every role, uh, you know, in the core, obviously, but they don't tell you, okay, you're covering that person. It's like you're covering the core and you're thinking, okay, who in the core? Oh, anyone in the core. It could be right, left, anyone. You know, and I was like, oh, okay, all right. So I would try and learn somebody's place, but then they would put me on the other one and had completely different steps. And, and of course, I had no idea. I, again, I wasn't fast enough to pick up the steps, you know, while the rest were all so used to. They were like, okay, come on. So I had a friend who helped me out a little bit, but, but there, there was a, a renowned performance of the three the, was it three, um, um, three corn, tricorn uh, hat, I think it's called. Anyways, uh, somebody had to pull out at the last minute 
last last minute and they said Zena, you know Zenaida you're on I'm like I don't actually know it I, I don't think I can do it I don't know it but I was too shy I would never say that so I was like okay so do you know it no and yeah and they said okay well you know you've got two hours and that's it I was thinking oh my god oh my god I can't I can't do this I don't know it uh, I went on stage <laughs> we did it <laughs> and this partner who was adorable who led me literally through the whole dance and at the beginning there were a couple of people in the wings by the end of the performance the wings were full <laughs> and everybody <laughs> were literally wetting themselves laughing that's how comical it was it was like the concert max just multiply that by a hundred and that was it it was just when everybody was up i was down when everybody was down i was up <laughs> and then there was this guy who will pull me and he was just awful and absolute awful and i we finished and i thought well i'm clearly going to get sacked because this was appalling but they were all laughing so hard <laughs> That they, they must have forgotten to sag me because they gave me another chance and I thought I don't think I can do this I don't think I can actually keep keeping this company because it's too I, I can't do it I don't think I can do it anyways the I, we kept going and we did all the things and, and then eventually I, I felt like I had you know started to find a little space for me and the company and um, and then another competition came up. And again, my mom said, you know, they're looking for someone to represent Spain and they are thinking of you. How about, you know, would you like to do it? And I said, you know what? Yeah, it'll be fine. At the beginning, I said no. And then my mom saw that I was a little bit like my, um, uh, my love for dance was fizzing away a little bit because I wasn't, I didn't feel like I, I had a place in the company. I, I wasn't feeling like I... Um, yeah, I wasn't feeling like an artist. I, I, so it was fizzing away. By then, my partner, well, I had a boyfriend who was an, a, a painter and he was a real artist. And, and I was just going, you know, I love that world. I love the creativity. I'm not sure I'm being creative, you know, doing this job. So my mom saw that and thought, I think you're in the wrong place. But, you know, why don't we go to Europe, to the, the competition, you get yourself together and see what happens. So I was like, yeah, okay, fine. So I was representing Spain and my next uh, person in the dressing room was representing France in the same. So uh, it was really, so she had all the times in the studio, she worked with Bejar, she was sent to God knows where, and everybody was working with her and blah, blah, blah. And I had, my time in the studio was after performances at 11.30. So I had 11.30 to 1 or 12.30 or whatever a.m. to rehearse. And sometimes a little earlier, maybe 10. So I would do class every morning, rehearsals, sometimes performances. And then I would go back. My mum came for two weeks before the, the competition and we would do another class and rehearsals. And so the solos, rehearsing the solos. And by then I had met Jacqueline Finaert, who was a teacher at one of the dance studios outside Paris Opera. And she was a phenomenal, phenomenal coach, phenomenal. And her background was dancing, but then she joined a theater group. And so everything, you know, she had the qualities of a dancer and the, and, uh, she, she taught ballet class anyway, so she had, you know, she would expect those qualities as a dancer, but then she will act, you know, she will make you act. And I was, you know, it was all about that. And my mum was all about that. And so um, I so enjoyed working with them both in, in classical work and in contemporary work. And so I, we started and then I went to the competition and it was fine and we started and then I won. And that wasn't a good thing to do. Coming back to Paris Opera, having won, and the girl who was from Paris Opera, who had gone through the school, who was amazing, to be honest, if she was out of this world, amazing. Um, 
I think got class a third prize or finalist or something. So that didn't pan down well. So I came back and the whole atmosphere started changing and I was a little bit like, oh my God, okay, all right. Now some people really were like, yay, Zen, you won, how exciting. And some people were like, you shouldn't have won, actually, you are not good enough. So I thought, okay, well, okay, I'll keep going, I'll keep going. And my mom said, how happy are you? I said, no, you know, mom, I think I'm not that happy. I, I think I want to stop, I want to stop dancing. And she said, okay, so before you stop, <laughs> why don't you try Jackson competition? <laughs> and then you will have more options because you'll get more, you know, other jobs. And I thought, yeah, okay, fine, we'll do that. So I went to the office, I asked permission, and they said, no, you can't do Jackson competition uh, because other, other girls are going to Jackson and you have to cover them. Um, so you have to stay. And I said, but that's not fair. You know, I'm, I'm a member as much as them of the company. She said, yes, but they are more senior. So they were, they're, they're going to go and you cover them here. Fair enough. I think I understand what they were thinking. So I said, well, if I want to go, what do I need to do? And uh, Brigitte Lefebvre at the time was the director. And she said, you know, Zen, if I were you, I would go. But I can't tell you that. It has to come from you. I think you've got a future and this is not your place. And, uh, and I said, well, thank you for telling me this because this is really valuable information. So I went. I won, I came back with my medals <laughs> and I resigned, <laughs> that was it. And then I started auditioning elsewhere. Well, to be honest, I think for me as a first company was perfect. It was a slap on the face, but the quality of dancing that I saw daily was so high. I mean, it, Sylvie wasn't around. She was at the Royal at the time, but I saw Isabel Guérin, I saw Platel, I saw Le Gris, Hilaire. I mean, the golden, golden era of dance were fizzing daily. So I would watch every night, I would watch a performance of them because I'd get bored. I didn't want to go home on my own. So I thought, well, I'd, I might as well just watch it. So I will sit on the wings and watch. And... Uh, I saw the best of the best. So nevertheless, you, you pick up so many, yeah, so many, so much information. The quality of their dancing was out of this world. It just, so when I left, I left with a, you know, a big sack of presents in a way. Uh, I, I didn't leave empty handed. I, I left full of information of, of a, of a, kind of dancing that I had never seen before. I mean, living in Paris was, yeah, it was gorgeous. It was fascinating. I grew up in an artistic family, so I didn't feel it was a cultural shock for me because, I mean, the buildings were, you know, amazing. The, the, the vibe was amazing. The, the ghettos, in a way, when you go out and you know, with your friends and you go into a cave to see an exhibition that they then the word sort of poets and so on. And so it was all like, whoa, this is so good. But my parents talked about it for, you know, years because they had that. And also they always created an atmosphere of art artists. And so we, every time we had dinner parties or whatever, or, you know, there, there was always someone in the house, always. We always had people in the house uh, to talk about a choreography because my, my dad was choreographing, uh, started choreographing at a young age. So he was always creating new work. And so music was always, always in the house. Um, uh, uh, musicians, uh, uh, singers, any, anyone that had a creative motive was always surrounding, you know, sort of, it was like a satellite in the house. And so we grew up with knowing all these people um, and, and, and being able to talk to all these people and understanding. Um, so when I went to Paris, it just maximized, you know, that. Uh, and I loved it. I loved it. Um, I loved every, every bit of it.
and I wish I had done more in a way. And I, it, I guess that it doesn't shock me that my, you know, boyfriend at the time was an artist in Paris because that's what I was attracted to, uh, just creativity. Mm. So after winning Jackson competition, went back to Paris Opera, resigned and thought, OK, I'm going to audition. But by then I had a better idea of what kind of, because of course Jackson was the first American competition I had ever done and sort of, and I experienced uh, America for the first time. So my brother got an offer in Boston Ballet and so I decided to try it too. And I also got a job there. And I thought, no, I don't see myself here. I'm, I'm, my brother was like, what? Come on, you, we have to do this together. And I thought, no, no, I can't do this together, actually. I think it will be, I don't know how I thought that brightly, to be honest, because I thought, no, we have to separate each other because otherwise, you know, we always do everything together, competitions together, everything. Everybody knows us as a team. And I think we need separate careers otherwise I think we are going to over you know we're, we're going to I don't think it's going to be a healthy uh, thing and so he stayed in Boston and I just decided to audition everywhere so I got a job in Canada I, I got a job in Monte Carlo I got a job everywhere and I was going on my way to head national because I thought that would suit me I like the work they're doing um, toll people again you know always looking after the toll um, and uh, and I thought, you know, and, and the tickets were easier from France to go to London, London, Amsterdam than if I went direct. So it was cheaper and I thought, well, I might as well audition, try to audition in London, but there's no way they will take me because I'm too tall and so on and so on. And also I don't fit the, I, I didn't think I fit it, you know, the stereotype. And I came to London and I auditioned and then suddenly they, they liked me and I was very shocked. And they said, oh, they asked me to stay another day. And I said, yeah, of course. And then another day and I was like, OK. And then they gave me a job and I thought, impossible. <laughs> this is not possible. And I, and, and I thought, well, it's a good job because they said that they wouldn't take me as a core of the ballet. They would take me as a coryphee because I had already had done Cor de Valle in Paris Opera. So they said, you know, it's only fair that you would come as a little bit higher. And I thought, well, this is it. I cannot say no to this job. And so I took it. I called Amsterdam and I said, you know, I'm, I, I won't be coming. I'm really sorry I've been offered this job and I'm going to take it. And at the time was Sir Anthony Dowell, who was director, and he said, uh, well, when do you want to start? Do you want to go home and, you know, think about it? And I said, no, 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 I don't want to think about it. I want to start tomorrow. And he went, tomorrow? But don't you want to go home and pick up your stuff? And I said, no, <laughs> because I was so scared that they will change their mind. I thought, you know, they probably would go, oh, we've made a mistake. And, you know, no way, I'm here to stay. <laughs> and so I stayed. And I remember watching some rehearsals. And, uh, and it was Romeo and Juliet and it was La Valse and so on and so on. And I sat there and I felt like I had come home. And I thought, I love this place. And this, is, this is what I've, I've been looking for. And how amazing that I, I happened to drop by because of the, you know, because it was cheaper. Otherwise I would have skipped this altogether. And I, it would have been a mistake because this is what I've been looking for, for so long. And, and now I got it. This is what I want to learn. And again, it was the golden era with Darcy, Sylvie, Johnny, you know, Michael Cassidy, Viviana Durante, Liam Benjamin, Carlos that just joined a few years later. Uh, I mean, it was just like an Altina, you know, Eric. You, everyone who was everyone was there. And I was just going, <laughs> you know, I want to be here. <laughs> so that was it. And that was the beginning of my journey at the Royal Ballet. I came back from Paris Opera, which, you know, was very, 
extra tight, you know, you couldn't talk to the principals, you couldn't talk to that, da, da, da. everything was really regimented and, and it felt really clinical in some ways. I'm sure it's all changed and maybe it was also my uh, perspective of things. But then I came to the Royal and it felt like, oh my God, such a release. People were talking to everyone. No one had this status of, you know, I'm better than you because Darcy immediately came to say hello. Uh, I was like, oh my God, but you're Darcy Bustle. <laughs> and uh, no, and everybody felt so normal. And it felt, to me, it felt, ah, oh, I thought, yes, this is it. This is where I want to be. I, I, I like it here. I feel like I can, I can carve my way. Um, I can try at least and carve my way. Um, then again, I talk to other people and other people feel that uh, maybe it's now, uh, I don't know, uh, and back then it felt more, more, but other people think that, oh no, the Royal Ballet is quite tight and quite, uh, you know, the establishment, you can really feel the establishment. And I'm thinking, oh really? No, it's really relaxed. <laughs> you should try other companies, <laughs> way tighter. <laughs> so maybe, maybe I, you know, by starting at Paris Opera, it eased up, you know, everything that came after that felt a lot easier for me. I used to always take class with Jacqueline Finaert in a place near Moulin Rouge, actually, and uh, where all the principals, everybody who was everybody, will come and take class and, you know, from all over the world, because she was fantastic. And Gigi jean Mer used to take class with, her, with us too, which was hilarious. And we would do floor bar and then into class. And and you make friends, you you know, acquaintances and and many people that had gone through Paris Opera School or the Conservatoire will do, then go into either other companies in France or abroad. And I was talking to this dancer uh, at the time. He was, yeah, I can't remember, a principal somewhere. And... Uh, and he said, you know, how are you doing? And blah, blah, blah. I know it's really hard. It's a hard company to get in from the outside. You know, if you haven't been down through the path of the school. And I said, well, you know, I'm thinking of leaving, but I'm petrified because, you know, leaving the best in my dream company and one of the most prestigious companies in the world is, you know, I feel like I'm like a loser leaving such an amazing company. But I think I need to leave to, to make my way forward. And he said, and I will remember it forever. He said, Zen, you have to follow creativity. Don't forget that you are an artist. You are not someone that is ticking the boxes. You are not in, in an establishment where you tick boxes. You have to follow your, the true artist. And so you have to go to the company that you feel more, more um, you, that you feel in a place where you can give that artistry or we, you can learn it or we, you know, where you can exchange it. Don't ever be afraid of moving because you feel the establishment is so big and so important. Um, and that really, it came in at such a good time for me because then after that talk, I remember thinking, I felt inspired of moving to somewhere where I felt I had something to give and, and also something to learn. Um, so it, it really, I, I felt at ease. And so I now always say to everybody that is in a little bit of a pickle if they need to leave the company or not, or I always say just don't be afraid because staying for the sake of staying because it's a massive establishment or because, you know, the, the, the seal of it, it's, it's the wrong way of looking. If you're an artist, you have to follow the artist, you know, you have to follow the artistry. Don't follow the stamp or the, you know, the wrapping paper, as I call it. It was an interesting process once I started because I felt that, again, you know, that I felt the director liked me liked something in me and so that motivated me to keep going and and think okay well I can make it I can immediately because of my contemporary background um, I was immediately taken to 
uh, contemporary pieces. So I was used a lot when it came to contemporary, neoclassical, you know, very much used. And so I felt like I, you know, I was doing better. I was doing well. The classical too, I was pushed in both directions. Um, so I started, yes, I did start it to look short term, uh, basically thinking, oh, if they've given me this role, then it means that maybe I can do this next role. And so short term sort of uh, goals. And, you know, if I could become a soloist by the age of 24, that would be really good. And so I became a soloist by the age of 24. And not because, I mean, I pushed myself, but, but, uh, but also it happened, of course. Um, and so on. And then, oh, if I could become a first soloist by the age of 26 or 25 or whatever, maybe I could. And so, it, and, and you knew what roles you had to do that, to, to create that big step. Um, so, yeah, I did a little bit of that. I did a little bit of that. It was my way of self-motivating because otherwise I was always very... Um, I was always open to new work. I loved it. Always loved new work, working with new choreographers, always picked for new work. Uh, so that was very natural. I, by then, was again going out with a choreographer. So again, uh, you know, uh, this choreographer was constantly doing things outside the opera house. So I was always tagging along and doing things and working with you know, wonderful artists that were had nothing to do with dance. So again, I was always drawn into the outside creativity that wasn't happening just in the dance world. So it was really, you know, it was really hard because I loved that world and I and I really needed to concentrate on my career, but I also loved that world. And uh, so it, I had to um, balance both uh, to feel motivated enough to actually go out and reach out outside the the dance world and then at the same time work towards a career in the dance world um so so yeah so that was the journey more or less that i took and eventually those short goals started to pay off and then eventually i was promoted to principal but by then i had done tons of things outside the opera house also so i was very much known in the world of dance not just at the opera house uh, as a ballerina, but I was constantly invited to do Dance Umbrella, which is a contemporary and very open um, festival. Um, so I was constantly, constantly uh, being involved with new work outside the opera house, constantly. There is that, that first soloist rank, soloist and first soloist, which is the most difficult rank of all, because you do you do your work as a soloist, you do the under work also sometimes, and you do the above work. So you basically do triple, you, you, you multitask tremendously. Uh, when I became a principal, it wasn't like all the roles that I had done before as a, fir a sec first soloist erased. I continued doing them because it was like a transition period. Um, before, that's what happened anyways. You had like a two year where you were a principle where you were still doing your old roles no matter what. So it, it felt like a much more organic transition. Um, so you don't feel too frightened of suddenly being at the top of the game, leading. And uh, yeah, it felt to me like it was very organic. And by then I was 27 or 20, yeah, 27. So I was, you know, I had been around, I think. I had done every role under the world. I had gone through every stage. Um, and in a way, I always think that it was the right time for me because I, I became more, I was mature enough to take on the roles. I think if I had come earlier, I wouldn't have done as well, I think. Um, I felt ready. Um, and so, and I loved it because in Paris Opera, I loved this dancer, this ballerina called uh, Pietra Gala, Marie-Claude Pietra Gala. And she was made étoile at the age of 27, which at the time was like ancient, <laughs> you know, it felt ancient to me anyways. Uh, but, 
But everybody was saying, oh my God, it's so late. You know, she's in the toilet at 27. So, and to me, she was a phenomenal dancer. She was one of the best and she had contemporary. So I really sort of related myself a little bit to her journey. And so when my time came and at 27, I became a principal, I was like, oh my God, I'm loving it. I'm, I'm loving the fact that my journey has been that slow, that I'm, I'm now able to grasp any role with maturity. Um, yeah, and that I, my contemporaries, you know, still continue hand in hand. Yeah, I, I really enjoyed, I, I felt it came at the right time. You can imagine, I mean, your daughter, who you never thought was going to be a dancer to start with, and then decided to be a dancer, brought up in a school. My mom was a teacher. My mom was a dancer. She became a teacher because she had to, you know. So again, her training as a teacher wasn't in an establishment where she did all the, her exams and what, no. She picked up, she knew the teachers that she liked. She knew the technique that she wanted. She was herself quite technical as a dancer. So she felt she had the tools to, to teach us, but again, it was, trial and error. She was, she was trying with us to see if it would work. So again, you know, her, um, uh, I think the fact that she had produced two little dancers, my brother who became a principal at 24 or 23, and me who was a principal at 27 in the most, you know, again, big companies, she probably must have felt so proud. Uh, well, she was proud for us, definitely. But she must have felt proud for herself too, going, oh, I can't believe we've done this. I can't believe we've created this, you know, we've allowed. So um, as a teacher and as a mother, both different roles, she must have been very proud. And I remember calling her because I was told in a party, <laughs> as you do. <laughs> so it was a leaving party, end of the year, and it was to say goodbye to Sir Anthony Dowell, who left the company and another one was coming in. And Anthony's partner, Jay, said, oh, congratulations. And I went, what for? I said, you're a principal. And I went, what? <laughs> what? I am? And I thought, you're joking. Please don't tell me because you really. And I said, no, come on. And he said, no, no. Didn't Anthony told you? I went, no, nobody's told me. I mean, we are in a party. It's like, you know, I've actually drunk a couple of champagnes. It's like, really, am I dreaming? He said, no, no. Oh, come, come over. He'll tell you. <laughs> so I came over and he said, oh, darling, darling, congratulations. I'm making you a principal. I was like, you know, I nearly didn't come to the party. I nearly didn't come to this party. And I thought, you know, I might, I need to come because I'm not a party person and Okay, fine, I'll come, I'll come. And I would have missed this. <laughs> I, would have, I wouldn't have known I was a principal. So immediately I called my mom and dad. They were screaming, of course, over the phone. Oh my God, I can't believe it, whatever. And that was it. And I became a principal. So I started the new season with Ross Stretton as a principal. As I was going through the ranks, I always had a couple of people. So it was Iñaki Urlezaga, it was David Pickering. And they were all tall. And so... I always dance with, with them, but as I went higher into the ranks, I started not having a partner. And trying to find a partner was always very, very difficult. So Anthony would bring um, either Roberto Bolle for me or uh, Johnny Cope accepted to dance with me. So again, he, he agreed, and, um, but I didn't have a partner. And it was a shame because I so longed to have a partner. Um, and I think it would have been a lovely thing to have a partner, to have a career with a partner must have been, you know, but I never had that. Um, and I begged and I begged and I begged and I begged every time to have a partner, but mm, they never thought it was important enough or I guess, I don't think you, they didn't think it was important enough. I think they thought they couldn't find one and I kept asking them to search and I would give them names and what about this person? But by then it felt to me like they, if they didn't know if they would be good enough for the company or so, so they, they were reluctant to suddenly bring someone 
from outside just for me um, without having gone through the ranks or something like that. I don't know. I never understood why. But um, so, yeah, so I would have guest dancers all the time, uh, which was great in some ways because you get to know people and, and you always had lovely dancers with you. And uh, but it was difficult because you always had five days only to prepare for a role while everybody had rehearsed for months and months and they, they knew, you know, their little details and how they were going to create. I just had a crash course on a role, you know, and it restricted not having a partner really restricted what I could do and when I could do it. Because if, let's say, Roberto was busy, it meant that season I wouldn't, I wouldn't do a role because he was busy or, you know, so I, they will skip me. Or, you know, my days were really like these are the dates and these are the dates. You cannot do any other date because your partner is not available. Um, so if you were sick, if you were injured, that was the end. Uh, so it was very restricted in that way. Um, but it's true that somehow it didn't affect my journey. I think at, at one point, halfway through, uh, because of course, as a youngster, you want to do everything and you're like, oh, I, this, this is the role for me. And this is, you know, I've always dreamt to do Giselle. I always dreamt to do Juliet. I always, uh, Aurora, whatever, blah, blah, blah. And I always battled with the fact that, you know, the answer was always, you are too tall. And I said, but since when <laughs> Aurora had to be a midget? I don't understand. No, but darling, you, you, you need to look young. And I said, but isn't that a, an actress, you know, an actor's um, challenge, not a size challenge? Um, but I understood, I understood what they meant, even if I was totally against it, because for me, it was all about saying something and, and producing what you, you know, um, um, being creative. And it wasn't to do with handicapsy of height. Um, but I, from, there was a point where I thought, okay, you either move out of this company and you go somewhere else where you can do all those roles, or you stay and accept that that's never going to come your way. Um, and you fight the ones that you think you might be able to do because there is not such boxed, you know, parameters. So they are not looking, they're looking for a young person, but it doesn't have to be immediate or, you know, uh, they're looking at. So it meant that that acceptance uh, was very clear on what roles I felt I could tackle or I could fight for because they would never give me Juliet. Forget it. Even if Darcy did it and Sylvie did it and so many tall ballerinas did it, they, I didn't fit the bill. Fine. Okay. Aurora. Fine. Giselle. Fine. I'll do without those ones. But, Bayadeh. Da da. Da da. Those ones don't, I, in my opinion, none of the roles require a certain height, you know, sort of uh, limit. But, okay, I get that you feel that those ones need to be for shorter people, but those ones, don't have a height limit. So I'm going to try and aim for those ones. So I did. So I did. And Manon was a really hard one because Manon wasn't, to be honest, the person that broke the barrier of a tall ballerina was Sylvie and then Darcy. And then when I asked, they were like, oh, no, you're too tall. And I said, but I've just done Sylvia and Sylvia's partnering up and down and up and down. And I, you know, why can you not give me Manon? It's the same. It's the same. And they kind of thought about it. And I said, listen, just give me, just try me. Give me a chance. As a principal, I think I am ought to have that chance. I, I, I deserve it. As an artist, I deserve it. If you don't like it, you take me out and I will never do it for the rest of my life. And it's fine. And it's fine. But give me a chance because I think I deserve it. And so they did. And it was, it was nice. It was nice to have the chance and fly with it and and try and, and uh, make it work for me. Um, as the two main choreographers at the Royal Ballet, being Ashton and Macmillan, uh, I never felt I was an Ashton dancer because he's, um, I always say Ashton is a little bit like doing crochet. There's steps and, and everything is, it, it kind of, um, 
you need to have to be trained that way a little bit, trained at school and they, they train very much in an Ashton technique where everything is a little bit of a crust and small and, you know, fast food work. And uh, I never I hadn't trained that way, but also I never felt that I had a, a food work that was Ashtonian, let's put it that way. So I had to learn that and and I loved it once I managed to try to get a grip on it, even if I felt I was a little bit too tall. For once, I felt I was a little bit too tall to get those steps going in such a delicate way and such a fast way. But, uh, but I loved the challenge and I loved the journey that took me there. And uh, little by little, I started to develop more and more Estonian um, uh, work. And, and, uh, and so when I got to do Month in the Country, when I got to do Marguerite, by then I felt like I knew what, I, what he wanted. And it's like crochet, little crochet work with um, very delicate thread. So, but it's a beautiful pattern of crochet pattern. And it's uh, so choreographically and musicality wise also very, very, very tight and gorgeously um, executed. When it comes to Macmillan, Macmillan is like knitting. So knitting with big, big knitting needles, you know, and it's a beautiful pattern, but it's a lot of air in between, you know, those, those, um, that cotton that, that knits. And what it allows you is to breathe in between and to be an actor also in between, uh, which I felt that was the difference between them both. One allows you also, but it's really, really delicate. And the other one is is bold, and so you 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 can you can kind of be um, a little bit elastic with it. Uh, I love them both, actually. I think they're both super creative, super musical, which is the thing that drives me the most is the musicality and create and and the steps, both very very eloquent with their steps. Um, which again, you know, how wonderful when you have such beautiful words to be able to speak, you know, in, in our job, to be able to produce these dance steps that kind of speak for themselves. Retirement period. I, by then, had two kids. And it's very interesting when you come back from having a child because uh, your world as a dancer is you know, so it's, uh, revolves around you, 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 your body, your body and you and you and the audience and your, you know, everybody that happens in the studio, your, your, the, the dynamic in the studio, your body, again, your body, a body, are you fit enough? Are you fit enough? You know, is this hurting? Is this hurting? Constantly. Is, and, you know, you're constantly in, living in such an egocentric way, <laughs> in a way, you know, and, um, and then you have a child and nothing about you is important anymore everything is for your child and you kind of transpose all that egocentric thing into your child. And I remember coming back to work and finding that dynamic really off-putting because I wasn't, I wasn't the center of attention anymore. I hadn't been the center of attention for a few months and anything I did was for my child, for the survival of your child pretty much because you know they can't talk, they can't do anything, they pee, they poo, they, they eat, that's all, they sleep. So they can't even tell you. And it's basically you become, it's, it's a very, uh, uh, I don't know, animalistic way of a survival. I'm going to try and make this child survive for as long as I can. Um, so you are no longer the center of attention. And when I went back to the studio, it was really interesting because everybody was the center of attention and I couldn't find a way of becoming the center of attention. So uh, all I felt was everybody was mad. <laughs> I thought, oh my God, is, everybody's crazy. <laughs> What's happening here? So it took a little while for me to go, oh, no, no, I need to be the center of attention again. I need to be the, you know, it's all about me again. It's all about what happens in the studio and my body and, you know. Um, and I found it really hard to swap from center to, oh my God, oh my God, my child, my child. Um, anyways, you know, you have 
two goes at that. I, I had two goes at that. Uh, and eventually you come back and you chill because nothing is as important anymore as it used to be. And uh, you enjoy the moments in the studio because they are your golden hours. Because then after that you are full on, you know, changing nappies or feeding or cleaning or blah, attention, attention, you know. You, you, and so those moments where you are alone in the studio with your partner or with your coach is like, ah, oh, heaven. <laughs> So I really cherished those moments. At the same time, you know, it was your time, my time to work, to fulfill myself. So it all goes hand in hand in a parallel way, in a way, you know, you have suddenly two roads instead of one. Um, eventually, you realize that those two roads start not quite, you know, being two in parallel and one starts deviating. And so it felt very natural for me. I thought, you know, I've done this. I, I think it's time mm, I want to start with, you know, my journey as retiring. So I had thought about it three years in advance to go, okay, this is the last time I would do this. This is the last time I would dance this. So in my head, it was always the last time. So I had been retiring for years in a way. Um, and, uh, and it was terrible when that last time would come back and they ask you to do it again. I was like, oh no, I don't. You know, in my head, it was the last time. I, I can't do it again. <laughs> you know, I had really given it up. And so, so yes, and then your body starts disintegrating a little bit. And every niggle in the past was a niggle that you could work through becomes an injury that you cannot work through. And suddenly all that started to, to come my way. And I thought, okay, this is, this is the natural way. This, this is it. I don't... You know, I cannot do this work at the top of my, you know, of my game. Is this worth it for me? No, because uh, my, I think my uh, expectations are too high. And if I don't meet my expectations, I'm not going to be a happy artist. So I started already thinking, okay, if this is not up to my expectations, that's the end. If this is, that's the end. That's it. So I started just knocking a few dances, da, da, da till I finished with the end. I was, I can say, because it came very organically and because I was very lucky to be in the position I was as a principal, uh, with a family, with people that supported me, um, family, friends, organization that supported me. I, it felt very organic. So at no point I suffered in an emotional way at all. I felt, very much that like going down an escalator. Uh, it wasn't, um, I had no, no fear and I had no regrets. Uh, so when I, the last performance happened and of course it was a gift in a way, you know, that my director at the time um, had produced this lovely, you know, goodbye, a send off. So it was a, a real, proper send-off uh, that I, in my head I hadn't thought about. In my head I was doing a performance like I had done three years ago and it was the last time I would ever do that that role, full stop. Um, so when the whole thing finished and you know and the curtain came down and I finally went oh, okay that's it well well done well done Zen. tap 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 you managed this is the last time <sighs> brilliant. Uh, and then it opened again, and then that got me. It just went the whole thing open again, and, and suddenly you, the overwhelming love was very palpable. For me, I could touch it, I could, I could feel it, not only from the audience, but from, from everyone, from, from the, my peers, from my colleagues, from you know, everybody that worked, that we worked together as a team, felt you know, very overwhelming. Um, and so then I came home and I remember the next day because I didn't have to wake up and go to class. And I felt so happy. <laughs> I was like, but I felt like something was missing. I was like, wait a second, I'm sure I'm meant to do something. And everybody said, well, are you going to class? And I went, no, like I'm done, I'm cooked, I'm, I'm done. And I wasn't quite done because I then went on tour with the company. So I had like a second, you know, so I went on tour 
or to Australia. So really my send off was my send off at the Royal Opera House. But then, but I, nevertheless, I thought, what, what are they going to say? Are we are going to sack you. I'm already, I, I, I've already <laughs> retired this fine. So I didn't, I think I just left three days and I didn't appear. And eventually I called and I said, can you tell me when the rehearsals are? And they were like, oh no, that till next week. Oh, great, great. Then I'll be, I'll be there next week. <laughs> and I properly just went like, oh, that's good. And I remember telling myself, don't relax too much because, you know, you still have a little bit of a journey left. Uh, and I had also prepared myself for a few other shows that I always wanted to do in my own terms without the anxiety of having to, you know, maneuver rehearsals at the Opera House with rehearsals outside and so on. So, you know, it was really nice. I had my little three um, pro like productions that I had set up for the rest of the year. And to be fair, the day I threw my shoes away was eight months later. So when I, I did Elizabeth, it was the last at the Barbican, we closed the curtains. I, did, I said a speech, I thank everybody and I said, this is the last time, this is my last time. And that's the end, goodbye. And threw the points to the bin. I think my husband collected them after. <laughs> He was like, I want to have your last pair of pointers. I was like, why? There is Melly that just points you. It's, it's in the past. And he was like, no, as a memory. So I think he's got them somewhere. <laughs> I've never seen them. <laughs> but it's true that eventually, I think it did feel after that, okay, so now, so now what? Now what? But it was a really interesting journey because for a while I had thought of uh, investing on who I was as a person, you know, and less as Zen the dancer. Uh, because you're always so backed up by your journey and your qualifications and your, you know, well, you, you are a master of your trade. So you are somehow Zen the master of her trade. And, and without my trade, who was I? Who, you know, what things make me the things that made you tick, the things that, that you enjoy, that you don't. And, and that's another journey, I think. Uh, the anxiety of, not, of having no work also, of not being able to be independently, um, you know, economically independent. That was a big shock for me, even if I had been married for, you know, already 12 years and we have a joint bank account. Somehow I felt that, you know, my, I had to give to the family, I had to economically support, you know, the family too. I was independent and yet I was no longer independent. I couldn't no longer support my family because I hadn't a job. And, uh, and I was very lucky again, again, you know, it's all to do with luck, you know, that my husband allowed in a way um, for me to be free of a job and, you know, maintaining the whole family, being able to maintain the whole family so I could actually take my time and enjoy life and enjoy and find something that will fulfill me in the future instead of uh, just rushing into another job. So I've been very lucky, felt all very organic. But that I can't negate that there is days where I wake up and think, what the hell am I doing? You know, am I doing the right thing? Should I be doing something else? Should I be, should I be running an, an organization? Should I, should I open a cafe? Should I, you know, should I be doing something instead of just slowly finding ways? Um, I'm enjoying the search for what I like. I'm enjoying falling into things because I've learned to say yes to pretty much everything that comes my way. And um, even if it's things that I naturally feel uncomfortable with or feel fearful, uh, because that's the other thing, uh, I felt that I only, my only mission in life is to dance and is the thing that I know best and is the thing that, yeah, that I know best. And, and of course, when you don't have that, you feel you know nothing. Uh, because, because I don't, I, I've never, you know, I don't have a, um, 
I never went to university. I never studied anything else but dance. Um, and, uh, and I feel like everybody comes with their degrees and their, you know, life experiences. And I have only had certain life experiences. And, and they're all very canalized, aren't they? They're, you feel like you're in a bubble, a safe bubble. And, and now you're in the big wild world and everybody works in a different way and you have to adapt all your experiences to, to what's happening in life. Um, but I'm enjoying it. I'm enjoying it. Uh, I've done things that I never thought I would do. Uh, I, I was never, I never thought I would be capable of. Um, and uh, I've said yes to things that um, in the past I, I said no so many times because I was so fearful. And now I'm like, well, what's the worst that can happen? Well, before I was so fearful of failing because our job is all about achieving and never about failing. And uh, you can't fail. You can't allow yourself to fail because a failing in a performance is a big deal. And, and yet failing in life is fine. It's, you know, you get up the next day and you continue. Um, and I had to adjust that, you know, that even if I tell my kids, don't, don't fear failing, but you know, then you have to kind of say to yourself too, a little bit. So little things like that. And I feel like I'm in a good place because looking back, I think my pa what my parents' life and life choices, the choices they've made through their journey, uh, have enormously influenced me in my journey uh, because I, I wanted to have a family. I knew it was possible to have a career and a family because my mom did it. If, if she did it with four kids, I can do it with two. I mean, I'm like cheating compared to her. Um, she, again, my, both my parents took tremendous risks and, uh, and they felt like a unity and we were all a unity when, when those um, decisions were made. Um, I feel like I'm a little bit more fearful than they've ever been. They were always so risk taken. Um, for some reason and 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 they made it work i feel more fearful certainly and but it's true that their choices have educated my choices too um and and um it's an interesting question to know if when if if their choices affected me at that age that my kids are now um because I feel my uh, childhood was so much fun. <laughs> it's just so much fun because there were certain rules, but no, not many, you know, we still went to bed very late because there was a performance or whatever and we were going to, or they wanted to see something. And so off we went, we all tagged along. And the next day you'll go to school early in the morning. At no point they thought, oh, they need a good rest, you know, or. No way. They thought they need to see this um, and they, they'll suffer tomorrow. So what? They're kids. And and I'm not like that with my kids. I'm a little bit like apprehensive. I'm like, oh, but they need to rest. And otherwise the school, while my mom is still saying, what are you doing? It's like, take them out to do this, you know, risk things with them. And I'm like, OK, yeah, maybe I should. So many times and the fact that we moved countries again, you know, I think I feel like my kids are missing out because I wasn't afraid of moving. Uh, so getting a job elsewhere in a foreign country was like pff, normal, was absolutely normal. And learning a new language, absolutely fine. Uh, you know, not, not scared about that because it happened throughout my, my and, and, and my kids are not. Uh, they're stable, they're in a home and they go to the same school. You know, they don't move around. Language is not, you know, quite there. Of course, yes, they do speak Spanish. They, they learn French in school and, and English. But it's not, you know, they're not forced to do it. It's, it just happens. Um, yeah, uh, I, I don't recall. My brother and I always say it was such a fun, you know, journey growing up because we were just mingling with everybody and, you know, we talked to everyone. 
so much fun, so much fun. Sometimes we had to be there for the lighting technicians to finish the lighting. So we were there playing. And as a child, you, you know, you collect all this information. So, of course, then you go to a major theatre and they talk about lighting. And you know, you understand what they're talking about. You are not, you know, you are not just the ballerina with the makeup and ready to go. And then the rest do. No, you are very much integrating every role because you've experienced it as a child. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think it, definitely their decisions have informed mine. I think I'm a little bit different because I'm more apprehensive and more fearful as a person that they that that they are. Um, and I think they never had the chance. My mom, when my mom retired, I remember her because I was 15, 16 at the time, and she really had a hard time retiring because her love of dance was vocational, was truly vocational. My parents didn't come from a family of dancers or artists. There were no artists around their family. So the, it was truly vocational. Mine wasn't truly vocational. It, it became the love of my life, but it didn't start as a vocational career. So in that sense, retirement is different already. My mom left the, you know, she always says if I, uh, le you know, if I had another chance, I would, I would be a dancer. I don't say that. <laughs> so, um, so that already shows the differences. Um, so it's, so my retirement felt more organic than my mom's. And I think probably seeing my mom suffer, leaving her passion, uh, I think informed my decision when I when I started um, thinking about retirement, thinking more in an emotional way. I wasn't a dancer that fit any boxes, so I always look my my the best coaches I had were the ones who would uh, make me fit, you know, whatever box people were trying to put me in, um, and so I always love uh, researching on how to make it work for the dancer because that's what I had to do myself as a tall ballerina and as a physical whatever physicality I had that uh, was lacking for certain roles um, I had to make it make it work all the time so um, that is my motto for me I don't know if I have the eye yet to be able to um, to to be able to tell the dancer, you know, find a way, this is the better way, this is... Because I think that's years and years of, of again, another craftsmanship, you know, uh, to have a really good eye to be able to know exactly what fits that dancer. But certainly when I'm at the front of the room and somebody's dancing for me, I will try my best that they find a way of... Um, allowing themselves to color uh, without breaking the lines of the stylistic lines. So, for example, we are talking about Ashton, we are talking about um, uh, Macmillan, you know, that there are certain stylistic lines that one has to follow, that you can't blur too much, otherwise it becomes uh, generic. And you don't want something generic, you want sp specialized something. So. But within that, those margins, you can make colors and, and you know, an and energy that is very personal. And, and that's what I'm after. So, yes, I will be very picky maybe on certain steps, certain qualities, certain lines, certain... But within that space, there is a whole ocean of colors and, and personalities and dynamics that is only personalized by the dancer. So... If I can bring both together and marry those two, then I would be very happy as a coach. Once you are a coach, I feel you have to be half psychologist, half coach, because to get something out of a person that is blocking themselves so much, you have to use so much psychology. And um, I don't have that 
background at all. And so sometimes I can be really blunt or sometimes some people come with their coloring pencils already, you know, and they throw it to you. And some people you have to go, have you thought about putting a bit of red in there, you know, or how about this other red? Don't you feel this red is much nicer? And, you know, so again, you have to be, some people come with ideas and some people you have to kind of show something so then they accept your ideas and, and make it theirs. Um, and yes, and the dynamic really changes in the front of the room because um, um, as you say, you know, everybody has um, different expectations of you as a coach, also of themselves. And so it, the dynamic is constantly changing. So you go into a studio with someone that is just going, tell me everything and then you go five minutes later you're in a studio with someone that says you know I don't want to know your opinion you are here just to make me look good but you know be careful with your words so you're constantly having to adapt to the dynamic of the studio um, yeah I, I've had really good experiences and I had few dodgy ones <laughs> most of the time is really good experiences most of the time I had a few difficult ones where I felt myself uh, but it, again it shows it's more a mirror towards yourself because I felt myself not being able to bring the best out, out of that dancer and so I felt like a failure and so the dynamic was so wrong because that dancer was making me feel as a failure but actually it was me who was making me feel as a failure so I should have been more grown up and just gone okay you know let's just Let's just work out a way of working that suits us both. Otherwise, we are going to be like, you know, and, and no one is going to get the best out of anyone. So, and, and it's a shame because uh, I think that comes with the years of, of course, knowledge and being in the front of the room, which I yet have to collect. <laughs> the only advice I would give myself as a youngster would be, don't be too frightened. It just... Yeah, don't be frightened. I think I lived too frightened of the consequences of everything. And so I would stop short sometimes because I was frightened of what could, you know, of the catalyst. Uh, and, and then when you get older, you realize that life continues and nothing is a big deal. Uh, Especially because I wasn't an awful person. I was a nice guy. I was a nice person. You know, middle, I'm nice. Well, it, you know. Um, but, uh, but I was too fearful. And so I didn't dare. You know, I didn't push that much. Um, I wish I had pushed more from time to time. Not always, from time to time. Yeah. <laughs>